is good to be uh, with you once again and to see uh, familiar and new faces. Let us uh, commit uh, this time of looking at the Word of God to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, we thank Thee for the, the blessings of uh, the Lord's Day. Mm. We thank Thee especially that we might now look to the Word of God, mm. and that we might be encouraged, exhorted, and moved to not only understand, apprehend, but to live in the good of these things. Forgive us our sins. Cleanse us from every secret fault. And grant to us a steadfast spirit. We pray in the Saviour's name. Amen. 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 Well, we read uh, God's word together from John chapter 14. In our own church in, in Dublin, I do bring greetings from uh, the church. Some, most times my daughters are with me. They're not with me this time. That's probably a, um, an element of getting older. Uh, Catherine now has a job and uh, work commitments and so on. And... Uh, also, Emily has a job as well, so there you go. Both of them are working now, so uh, work commitments. That's just you need to take advantage when our children are young to spend as much time with them as possible because they do uh, grow up mm. and, uh, uh, and so on. So John 14, I'm not so much speaking on this passage, even though I've been uh, preaching through John's Gospel for the last, I don't know, two and a half years now in our own, in our own church. We're up to John 14 at the moment. Um, recently I've done a, two sermons on uh, principles relating to the love uh, to our love for Christ to our love for Christ and that was really rooted in verse 15 uh, literally just the four words there in, in verse 15 if ye love me if ye love me keep my commandments and we spent three sermons on that one verse um, we looked at 10 points dealing with the love uh, that we should have for Christ and 10 principles of that love. And then uh, we spent a sermon also looking at uh, the phrase, keep uh, my commandments. So I want to look with you this morning uh, at those points. And um, we, I don't know how far we'll get, whether we'll get the 10 done this morning. We might only get five uh, done, look at the other five uh, this evening. But we'll see how far... Uh, we get by the grace of God. So, the first principle, the first principle, the first, if we're to ask the question, what is love to or what is love for Christ? It's very important, isn't it? It's very important that we understand what these things are, that we're not just talking about ideas, but we must define these principles and we must understand the context and the, the biblical context of these ideas not i asked someone uh, in the open air on on friday do you love christ and immediately the answer was yes now I, I wondered at the time how much the person had really ever thought about what that means what does it mean to love jesus does it come naturally? You know, do we love him just because we're human beings and he's our God? Is it just natural to love Christ? Well, we know <clears throat> that is not the case. It is certainly not the case because of the experience the Lord Jesus had in his life. In fact, in fact the, right back in John chapter 6, we see that most people even at that point, began to leave him, so much so that he turns to his, his disciples and said, will ye also leave? So it's not natural for us to love Christ. It does not come just by human nature. So I want to begin at least this morning looking at 10 truths or 10 principles relating to love for Christ and the first principle is this we must and I'm emphasizing the phrase must 
we absolutely must be born again. We must be born again of the Father if we are to have any love for Christ. And therefore this answers the, the, the introduction, doesn't it? We cannot by nature love Christ. In fact, by nature, we are enemies of Christ and therefore we must be born again. We must be begotten of the Father if we are to have any love, any genuine love for Christ. When the Lord Jesus was correcting and chastising and condemning, if you like, the Jews for their lack of love uh, towards him in John 8, 42, Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me. We can look at this from the negative and the positive. Negatively, they did not love Christ because God was not their father. Positively, if God was their father, they would inevitably and absolutely love him. So we see here the, the uh, it's day and night, isn't it? If we're not born again, we will not love Christ. If we are begotten of the father, we will love him. And therefore, the great need the great need of the new birth. So it's not enough to be religious. It's not enough to do religious things. It's not enough to come to church. It's not enough to have our names on a, a, a membership register that I'm a, a member of whatever church I'm a member of. We must have an internal work of God. We must be begotten of God in order to love Jesus Christ. This is the most important of all the ten points I would suggest that we will consider this morning and this evening. Calvin notes on this. He says, quote, Christ's argument is this. Whoever is a child of God will acknowledge his firstborn son. In other words, if we are children of God, we will, by that fact, acknowledge the firstborn son, our, our elder brother, if you like. That's what Calvin says. But you hate me, and therefore you have no reason to boast that you are God's children. In other words, you cannot be God's children. As I think verse 44 goes on to say, you're of your father, the devil. So 1 John 5 verse 1 reads, Whosoever believeth, that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God. So we see that faith as well as love for Christ is a result of uh, the new birth. And everyone that loveth him, that begat, loveth him also, that is begotten of him. So we trust in Christ, we love Christ, we love the brethren, <clears throat> because we are born again. We often think, don't we, of that statement, that experience of uh, George Whitfield when uh, a woman came to him and said, Mr. Whitfield, why do you keep preaching? Ye must be born again. And his answer was, Madam, because ye must. Ye must be born again. John chapter 3. We must be born again even to perceive, even to have a bare comprehension of the things of the kingdom of God. The, the idea is that we're, we're in a different world, we're in a, in a different dimension, and we need to be brought into the dimension of the kingdom of God in order to perceive those things. And again, 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. The point here by, by the apostle is that there is no love outside of God. We cannot love Christ apart from a union with the life of God. Just as true that a, a fish cannot live out of water, we cannot live in water, it's different dimensions, a different world in that sense. We must have the nature of God. We must have the life of God. 
in order to have the love of God shed abroad in our hearts. So as we come here this morning, we don't come satisfied in our works. We don't come satisfied in what we do, but we long for God to impart that life, and not just the initial works of regeneration, but the, the fullness and the fruit of regeneration, that our love for Christ might grow and grow more and more earnestly to love him. So John Gill notes, in regeneration, love to Christ is always implanted. It is the root. It is the seed of love to Christ. They're my words, not Gill's. It is the fruit of the Spirit, which always comes along with the superabounding grace of God in conversion. So he says, where there is no love for Christ, there can be no regeneration. Where there's no love for Christ, there can be no regeneration. So we can test if we're born again. Do I love Christ? Not perfectly. Not perfectly. But do I love him? Examine our hearts this morning. Especially as we come to the Lord's table. Especially as we come to the Lord's table. Do I love the one of whom this speaks? Has God implanted love in my soul for Christ by the seed of regeneration? Has God began that good work? That's why Paul could say my, my testimony verse is... And it wasn't originally my testimony verse, but it is now over the last number of years. Philippians 1.6 Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. So are we born again? But then our second point is this. Love for Christ is fundamental and essential in our service for Christ. Love for him is fundamental. It's basic. It's absolutely basic. I cannot serve Christ if I do not love him. And any service in the name of Christ that is estranged from love to Christ is unacceptable to God. Completely unacceptable to God. We'll be reading this evening in Deuteronomy the, the, the command to love the Lord our God. Because this is, the, in, a, in a sense, the, the whole foundation for what we do. And that's why in, in John's Gospel, in John 21, it's wonderful when the Lord Jesus uh, comes to, to Peter. And doesn't say to him, Peter, do you repent of the sin of denying me three times? That's not what he asks. He doesn't say to him, Peter, are, are you uh, remorseful for that sin? No, the simple question is, lovest thou me more than these? Because that and that alone is the foundation for service. And that is why that question is put three times. That becomes the, 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 the foundation in the life of Peter for the service of Christ. Mm -hmm. Peter, if you love me, then feed my sheep, feed my lambs, take care of them. If you love me. Mm -hmm. So Calvin notes that by these words, Christ means that no man can faithfully serve the church and employ himself in feeding the flock if he do not look higher than to men. Yes, we serve men, but we do it out of love to Christ. We love Christ and serve men. We're not 
philanthropists, is that the word? You know, you know we're, we're not those who have a, a love for humanity. No, our, uh, the, the foundation and the root of our service is the love of Christ. And our fifth point will be similar to that, but different. Calvin goes on to say, No man therefore, listen to this, very practical. No man, therefore, will steadily persevere in the discharge of this office unless the love of Christ shall reign in his heart. How true that is. Mm -hmm. That's why so many men, after a short few years, step down from the ministry. Mm -hmm. You see, I I was reading, actually, Martin Lloyd-Jones over the last few days, and Martin Lloyd-Jones said that the call to the ministry is not just based upon the need. Some people enter the ministry or become missionaries because they hear of the need in Africa, or there's more of a need in Europe now than Africa, but in the old days, the need in Africa, the need in Asia, the need in whatever it was. And they would hear the need and feel a compulsion to go because of the need, but the need alone will not keep us in the work. We will burn out if there's not that love for Christ Mm. and that ongoing relationship, just like a marriage. A marriage cannot survive just based upon, well, I made a vow, I better keep it. There must be the ongoing love. There must be that intimate, loving relationship to sustain the marriage. And without that, the marriage is doomed. So love for Christ is fundamental and essential in the service of Christ. Thirdly, love for Christ is to to be the supreme love of our hearts. Not only is love to Christ essential, it is to be our greatest love. So the Lord says in Matthew 10, Verse 37, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now, think about this. There's two parts in that verse. And I would suggest the first is difficult, but the second is much more difficult. To love Christ more than my parents, that's a challenge. But to love Christ more than my children, that's an even greater challenge. We we live in a, a generation of the idolatry of children. Where children are are, are, are children and we are to love our children. We're to protect our children, we're to provide for our children, we're to sacrifice for our children, but we're not to turn our children into gods. And people do this. They make that their children the center of their universe. And children get this. And then children think, well, I'm the center of the universe. Nor are to love Christ above all. And our children are to get the message that Christ is our chief love. Mm. Christ is our chief love. And I would suggest to you, in fact, I would more than suggest that I would emphasize to you the greatest way for you to love your child is for you to love Christ more than your child. Mm. So we have examples in Scripture, Abraham and Isaac and others. Mm. So John Gill notes, as Christ is infinitely above all creatures, he is to be loved above the nearest and dearest. That man, therefore, listen to what Gill says here, that man, therefore, that prefers father or mother to Christ, their instructions, their orders, to the truths and ordinances of Christ, to please them, breaks the commands of Christ, rejects his gospel, and either denies him or does not confess him, 
Our Lord says is not worthy of me, or as in Munster's Hebrew Gospel, he is not fit, he's not suitable for me. Thomas Watson said that when our relations stand in our way to heaven, we should either leap over them or tread upon them. That's Puritan theology when it comes to our relations. Leap over them or tread upon them to get to Christ. Now, some people use this for wrong reasons. Some people don't honor their father and mother and use as an excuse the commands of Christ. We have to be careful, of course. We're always to honor our father and mother and love our families. It's only when there's a conflict between, so if our family says to us, you shouldn't go to church, we say, you judge whether it is right to obey man or God. Only when there's a conflict, and then we choose Christ. This is so important that our fourth point, briefly, is that there's a curse over them that do not love Christ. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 22. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, maranatha. So as someone has put it, let him, be, let him be accursed because our Lord cometh to execute judgment on those who love him not. Love for Christ is so appropriate that the lack of it requires nothing less than everlasting condemnation. This is why Luther, and we, I think Luther's probably got mentioned more times this year than the last 500 years mm. but he feared he, he said to his father confessor I have committed the unforgivable sin I've committed the unforgivable sin and, and when he was qu quizzed or questioned what do you mean I do not I cannot love God mm. I do not possess within me a genuine, and he recognized that. He recognized that he didn't genuinely love God. I only see him as my judge, as one who is ready to condemn me. How can I love him? Luther saw his problem. Don't ignore the problem. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Do I love God? Do I love Christ? Has God implanted within me by regeneration a genuine faith, trust and love for Jesus Christ? And then fifthly, and you might think this is like point two, but it's different. The love of Christ and love to Christ is the compelling force of our service. Now, it's different. Point two was that it's the essential foundation of our service. <coughs> this point is, it is to be that which actually moves our service. If I can illustrate the, maybe it just comes to mind, we, we need a road for a car to travel on, but then the petrol is what moves the car along the road. Silly illustration, but there you go. Mm. Love to Christ is the foundation, point two, but love for Christ actually compels our service, moves us. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14, for the love of Christ constraineth us. The love of Christ constraineth us. It's, it's the motivating factor. It's what energizes our service. It's not just a, an entrance to the ministry. It's what energizes the ministry. It's what gives life to our ministry. It's what enables Paul and Silas at midnight to lift up songs of praise while they're in the shackles of a Roman dungeon, surrounded by the, 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 the awful circumstances 
worshipping and praising God. It's what energizes the disciples in, in, in early in the book of Acts when they are beaten for the name of Christ. And they praise God that they are counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Love for Christ is the compelling force of our service. Notice here in, in 2 Corinthians 5 that there are two key reasons attending or given by Paul in this. First of all, the state of those for whom Christ died. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. The gospel has in its remit awakening from the dead. Those for whom Christ died. Paul realized, yes, Christ has died, but he died for those who are dead in trespasses and sins. And it is the gospel of Christ that shall awake them out of their death. It is the gospel of Christ that will cause them to know new life and a new love for him. Amen. So Colossians 2 and 13, and you being dead, in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together by the gospel, quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. We have a wonderful gospel, don't we? We have a wonderful gospel. We have a wonderful message. And we are heartbroken every time we go onto the streets like we did on Friday and we see the people completely oblivious and unconcerned and unmoved by the gospel of Christ. And we preach with all our heart and we just walk by as if it's nothing. But we have a wonderful message. So, Ezekiel is told to preach to a valley of dead bones. And it's, it's emphasized they were, they were very dry. They're beyond human hope. But what's the answer? The preaching of the gospel. Amen. The proclamation of the gospel can give life to dead bones. Hmm. I know that the night I was converted, I was on my way to a very different circumstance. God brought me into a home. I heard the gospel. And that night in, in my heart, suddenly I realized this is true. The gospel is true. Christ is true. Christ is real. Christ is risen from the dead. My sins are forgiven because of him. Amen. That's our message. That's our hope. That's what moved Paul. That's what constrained Paul. Christ has died. He died for those who are dead in their trespasses and sins. And they need to hear the gospel. And we need to go into all the world and preach the gospel. It's the only hope. There's no hope in the conscience of men. Men have misunderstood Romans 2, thinking, well, those who have not heard the gospel might be saved because of a conscience. There's no hope outside of the gospel. That's why the Calvinist missionaries of the last number of hundred years have gone into the world knowing that the gospel alone is the hope of sinners. And then the second principle in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 15, the reason for which Christ died. And that he died for all that they which should live not henceforth unto themselves. But unto him which died for them and rose again. Titus puts it this way. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. From all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. We are a peculiar people, aren't we? But we're his people. We're the particular people of God. Zealous, listen to this, zealous of good works. Living for him 
loving him, desiring to walk in the light and glory of his grace. Paul writing to the Thessalonians, the last verse for this morning. <laughs> who died for us, 1 Thessalonians 5.10. Who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. It's love for Christ. It's all about loving Christ. Lovest thou me, Christ? If, if the Lord was here, he is here. Or the two or three are gathered there, am I in the midst? He's here. And if he was to speak now, and he is speaking now in his word, he says to you as he did to Peter, Lovest thou me? Do you love me? Do you love me? If you love me, then serve me. Serve my people. Serve my people. Amen. We're going to sing together from Psalm 63.